Okay, good afternoon to everybody, and as always, thank you so much for taking the time today. My hope is that this will be of some value to you, and again, if we don't have the answers today, what we will do is we'll try and work uh, to get you the answers. Uh, kind of like usual, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about where we think we are right now uh, in the campaign season, uh, and then of course, again, open it up to your questions and, and welcome your questions on anything. So as of today, we are about five and a half months into Operation Shafak, uh, the Afghan uh, national campaign plan for 2016. And so as we look at the overall holistic view of the country and where the ANDSF was, where they are going, and just really the overall status, and we try and marry that up with what we have seen at the institutional level as well, overall we think that the Afghans are still generally on track with their campaign plan. Now that is not to say uh, that it, the execution has been flawless because there clearly have been some challenges. Uh, and it's also not to say that it has not come without cost because there has been cost. And finally, we do know that the Taliban has had some, some tactical victories and that will likely uh, continue as well. But when we look at the overall larger perspective of where the ANDSF is today, and we compare it to this time last year, we still believe uh, that they are doing better uh, this year than they did last year, and we believe that they are overall continuing to remain uh, on a positive trajectory. And then we contrast that with the Taliban, and I don't want to understate the Taliban capability. At the end of the day, we all know they are the threat to the government of Afghanistan and the people of Afghanistan. And so they certainly do have capabilities, but they're not invincible. And they've got their own challenges. And they've taken casualties, and they've got leadership issues, and they've got some financial issues, and they still have a breakaway faction. And perhaps most important, at this point, uh, as we approach the end of August, they still have not been able to achieve their strategic desire and goal to seize a major population center here in Afghanistan. So I think the last time we briefed was really the end of July. And at that point, the ANDSF was engaged in phase three of Operation Shafak. And that was specifically focused down in Nangahar against ISK. And so what we've seen from that point is that we think that the Afghans overall were pretty successful down in southern Nangahar. The results of that operation they really include hundreds of ISK dead. We've seen some of the key leaders killed. We've seen some of their command and control locations as well as their logistics locations destroyed. And then most important is that ANDSF has been able to go back in and secure population as well as parts of most of Kat, parts of Daybala, and even parts of Achi. And again, the fight there is not over. It hasn't concluded just yet. We know that there will be additional fighting, and we know that there will be additional challenges. But overall, we think the ANDSF did fairly well in Nangahar, and we hear that from the testimonies of the people who were essentially liberated from this ISK control. So the next area, of course, is that fight was continuing and, and wrapping up. What we saw was the Taliban starting to launch their attacks down in Helmand. And of course, we saw that really kicking off at the end of July. And when I say attacks, in our view, they really are a series and uh, a bunch of different raids. And so what we saw over and over again was a Taliban force would get together uh, and mass up to about 20 to 30 people. They would go out and attack an ANDSF checkpoint, and then in a couple of instances, a district center building. The ANDSF would withdraw to a safer location uh, with their a uh, to a larger ANDSF formation. The Taliban would loot the location, and then in most instances, as a larger ANDSF formation came back in, the Taliban would move out and go out and do it. Again, clearly concerning, but on the flip side of it, they are still not able to hold, in most instances, major population centers or major strategic areas uh, down in Helmand. Of course, though, what did all this do? It certainly caused concern with the population in Helmand, and understandably so. And of course, the ANDSF now, over the last week to 10 days, has been working to stabilize that. They put some additional troops down there, and they are making slow and steady progress as they try and go back out and reassure the population of what they're doing. But really, so as Helmand began to stabilize, again, about a week or so ago, 
What we saw, of course, was this uptick in fighting uh, in Kunduz. And as you're all aware, there clearly has been fighting up in the northern districts of Kunduz uh, really since the end of Ramadan. But of course, what we've seen in the last few days is an increase in what the Taliban are doing and who they are attacking. But by and large, as we observe it, what we are seeing is something similar to the south, where you see relatively small Taliban formations that are able to go conduct a raid. Um, the ANDSF withdraws, they get their uh, larger force back together, and then they go back in and they reclaim in most areas, in most instances, those locations. And so as we look up in Kunduz today, um, we still don't believe that the Taliban have been successful in seizing any of the large population centers uh, up in that area. They are clearly still a threat. And you've heard me talk about this population aspect. And, you know, historically there's a lot of discussion about who's in control of X number of districts and who controls this amount of terrain and, and those types of things. But what we believe, particularly this fighting season, is the important thing to take a look at is the population control. And the reason we think that's important is because the Afghans think that's important. They have built their entire concept of this sustainable security capability and strategy on the idea of trying to secure these major population centers uh, as well as some of the major infrastructure. And again, we also know that the Taliban is absolutely focused on trying to take a large population center, specifically down in Helmand, and they'll continue to do that. So as we look to the next couple of months, what we believe is that clearly we've still got a lot more fighting season to go, unfortunately. We will absolutely see the Taliban try and conduct operations and attacks again in Helmand. They will do their best to threaten Lashkar Gah, and we will see this continued pressure up in the north uh, in the vicinity of Kunduz City. But ultimately, we do still feel like the ANDSF is on the right track. They are prepared and will be able to defend both Lashkar Gah uh, and Kunduz City. So with that, uh, I'll go ahead and pause, Marie, and, uh, and I welcome your questions. Thank you so much, General. I'm Shoshana Ali from Kurshi TV. Here are uh, a few questions. First of all, uh, in this season of, of fighting, we are just seeing that Taliban have uh, some gains, especially in their gains or uh, particularly in terms of uh, taking some uh, equipment. And for example, some home base, some of the uh, tactical things that our forces have. What's your plan for destroying them? Because right now in the fight, they are using these uh, equipment against our forces, and it's a big trouble for them. Second, uh, still we are uh, facing new challenges <coughs> in Babylon, and Kunduz, and also in Helmand. I was uh, in front line of a bad man uh, two days ago uh, for Bomi. So we saw in there that uh, they have uh, so gains in there and they have some achievements. So what are your particular plan for supporting Afghan forces in those provinces that fight is uh, going on? And the third, are you uh, ready for giving us much more air support or not? Yeah, great. <laughs> So uh, let me try and take those in order uh, and, uh, and go from there. But they are, of course, all certainly connected. So the question of equipment. There's no doubt the Taliban have been able, as a part of some of these tactical successes they've had, they've been able to loot ANDSF material, and they've been able to steal equipment. Um, and so we absolutely have observed that. Um, when I talk about really what are, are we going to do, it's really more a question of what is the ANDSF doing and how can we kind of help them. So we do know that we have seen in the past, or over the past month, where you'd see a couple of captured Humvees and we collectively were able to destroy those Humvees. Um, and so we, we do believe that the ANDSF is focused on that, but we do know that the Taliban is able to use some of these capabilities uh, against the ANDSF. Uh, in terms of what we're going to do regarding air support and the situation in Bogdan, again, our role is primarily to support the ANDSF. And so my sense is both the MOD and the MOI can probably give you more specifics and more detail on exactly how they're approaching it. But our role continues to be twofold. So our first role is continuing to conduct the train, advise, and assist. And so we do maintain our elements uh, up in Mazari Sharif, but they've got the ability to move 
with the 209th Corps leadership to help provide them assistance and advice uh, and those types of things. And then from a U.S. standpoint, again, not NATO, of course, the United States does have the authority uh, provided by President Obama in January or in June to conduct and provide, or provide combat enablers in, a, in support of the Afghan strategic campaign plan, which of course does include Helmand and it does include Kunduz. And so we can look for opportunities to provide supporting fires or other support to the ANDSF as they engage. I think sometimes there may be a perception uh, right now that there's just a tremendous amount of fire support coming from the United States. And I would tell you, in all honesty, the Afghans really do have the lead for that. The A-29s are being used quite a bit, as are these MD-530s. And so we do have the ability and we do provide that type of, type of additional assistance to the Afghans as they move forward in their campaign plan, and we'll continue to do that. Great. Majid? Yeah, two questions. Mm -hmm. um, on Helmand and both in the fighting in the North, you mentioned the Taliban numbers are very small, but when you look at the Afghan response, it seems very panicked. Mm -hmm. You see senior generals rushing in to fight at the district level. You see senior civilian officials running to fight at the district level. In your assessment, what is what is the cause of the Afghan forces' struggle against that small force? Sure. And secondly, uh, there are reports of uh, hundreds of uh, U.S. forces arriving in Lash at the civilian airports, uh, what is their intended goal and what will, we, what will they be doing out of flash that they couldn't do out of shore? Out of sure, sure. So the first question, Amiji, um, you know, one of the things that, and I think you know this to be very, very true, the Taliban is very good um, at what we refer to as their information operations capability. And so they've got the ability um, to essentially provide the perception that they are stronger than they actually are. And again, I don't want to understate the Taliban, particularly in Helmand, that is their main effort. And that is where they put their best fighting and the bulk of their forces to try and achieve that. But at the end of the day, they're not as strong as they would have some perceive uh, that they actually are. And so they are able to cause, at times, some level of panic, as you described, just because they are pretty darn good at being able to spread this information that in most cases is not going to be true. You ask about the senior generals and, and their presence down there. And I think, you know, historically, if you look at military command and kind of the art of military command, what you find is that good commanders will put themselves at the place where they can be most decisive and where they can best influence the fight at a given time. Now, in a perfect world, would you have senior leaders moving around like that? Perhaps not. But at the end of the day, we find that most of the challenges for the ANDSF are ultimately tied to leadership. And so we think it is a positive thing to have good, strong leaders that are willing to get out and set an example, as well as take charge for what is going on, and then further help develop some of their subordinate uh, leaders. Uh, as for uh, Lashkar Ghan, the troops that you mentioned, so what we've done is, as I think you know, we provide train, advise, and assist to not only the Army Corps, but we also provide that to the police zones. And so the police zone uh, for Helmand is based out of Lashkar Ga. So what we've tried to do is get some advisors down there to assist the police zone headquarters and their leadership with more of a focus, train, advise, and assist. And the troops that have gone down there um, are really focused on the force protection of that to make sure they're secure. So what you won't see is they're not about to, to go out and conduct operations or something like that. What we're trying to do is get, we refer to it, Mujib, as an expeditionary advisory package. So we want that with the police zone headquarters. And to help secure that, uh, we've got the troops uh, down there uh, to help secure that expeditionary advisory package. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, quick follow-up on Mujib, mm -hmm. then uh, another question as well. Um, how many troops are we talking about in, in the last year? We're in fact, 30 maybe, is that correct? And are they all from the rest of the support mission? Um, and second of all, if when you're down in Helmand, I know you said that, that the NDSF are able to take back some areas that have been taken by the Taliban, mm -hmm. but my impression from mm -hmm. uh, my recent trip to Helmand was that, was that they have not taken back any areas. And if they are, it's very limited, and mm -hmm. it's only with help from their own special forces commanders. Mm -hmm. 
So what are the plans of taking back some of the more recent districts that have been taken, like Nawa and uh, Those areas have been peaceful for a long time, mm -hmm. and have been, the people have been recently displaced. And what's the US or NATO's role going to be in, in helping uh, uh, them take those? Sure. So, and so on your first question, as, as you can probably understand, I can't provide you the specifics of the numbers, but we're talking around 100 or so. Um, and so that, that's about the extent of that. And the RS? Or yes, the US? they are. I mean, they're U.S. They're US soldiers, but it's part of the larger RS, train, advise, and assist mission. Um, so the second component to it is what is being done about taking back some of these districts and, and how is that going? Again, so I, I really would refer you back to the Ministry of Defense. What we are trying to do is help that core come up with the appropriate plans uh, as well as to discuss the resourcing so that they are able to conduct that. And what we're told is that they have made some progress heading back towards Marja and it's going to be slow and we, we know that. Um, as you've probably heard the Ministry of Defense say, you know, one of their big concerns is if they move too quickly causing civilian casualties. And, uh, and so they are concerned about that also. But our role in that from a resolute support standpoint is very similar to what we're going to try or what we're trying to do in Boglan and Kunduz is provide that train, advise, and assist uh, to the 215th Corps as well as to the corresponding uh, police zone. Uh, and again, we do that with our forces that are down there. And then as the opportunity presents, because Hellman is certainly a part of this larger strategic campaign plan to be able to provide enablers to assist them. But, you know, as we, again, whenever I say enablers, everybody immediately jumps to the idea of kinetic strikes. Uh, but we have not taken any kinetic strikes down there in several days. This has really been the Afghans that are, are getting this up and going uh, and moving. And then finally, you mentioned uh, the use of the Afghan Special Forces. And that, of course, is a key component for what the ANDSF does. And you've heard me say it before, and, and I still absolutely believe it to be true, which is the ANDSF Special Operations Forces really are the best in the region, and they do this well. And they are getting used to try and essentially, um, you know, break open some of these areas so that conventional forces can follow in. And so our role continues to be the train, advise, and assist uh, aspect of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, my, question is, my question is also about the Kunduz. Uh, I mean, if uh, uh, the Taliban are not uh, that big forces, and why they are still being able to gain more uh, footprints on them? Especially in the north, I mean, if you see, uh, the situation is really very out of hand in there. Uh, you see that we are going towards the same situation like last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Kunduz, there is only uh, the one district, uh, Aliyabad, and the city of Lashkargat that is under the full control of the Afghan forces. Mm -hmm. um, and they, uh, they are continuing to uh, gain uh, uh, more ground. Um, so, I mean, Obviously, we always blame the leadership of the Afghan forces for this, but here, I guess it's uh, the prestige and the reputation of the uh, NATO presence and the, uh, especially the uh, American presence is also at stake here. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if they are not that strong, why, why they are uh, being more successful? Sure. Well, and, and again, I, I sincerely, I, I don't want to sound the following to sound like I'm, I'm trying to be condescending by any stretch. But at the end of the day, this is a tough fight. It, it is a war. And the Taliban are, they are a challenging foe. Uh, and we've seen that over and over again. And they do have capability and they do have capacity uh, to really inflict damage not only on Afghan civilians, but certainly uh, on the security forces. And so what we do see is, you know, the difference between last year and this year is we find that the security institutions are focused completely on what we know to be the Taliban's goals. Helmand uh, and then Kunduz and trying to seize Kunduz city. And so just the mere presence, you've seen the Minister of Defense visit there recently, you've got the, the Deputy Chief of Staff of the Army uh, that's in Kunduz right now. Just that level of focus um, suggests that the ANDSF is absolutely um, focused on this effort. And we feel confident again, that, lot, that uh, Kundu City uh, is not going to fall, and we will be there. We being NATO uh, and also the U.S. unilateral capabilities will be there to assist uh, our Afghan partners. But again, I don't want to suggest that this is going to be easy because it's not. It, it is a difficult 
fight uh, for everybody involved. Um, but ultimately, we do feel like the ANDSF continues to make this slow and steady progress. The reason why I ask that because it's at this, at, on this side we have the numbers, we have the equipment, mm -hmm. we have the air support, um, and still the things are going down the pan. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, if, if, if I, a follow up question, I mean, how many airstrikes did we have about for the past few weeks? Sure. I don't have for the last two weeks in, in Kunduz uh, at my fingertips, but I would tell you in the last three days, there's probably been three to four strikes. The bulk of the strikes have been conducted by the ANDSF. And they've got some of their aircraft that are based up there, some of these A-29s, so they are conducting strikes. Um, and, you know, the, the, the question is how does it, you know, kind of, uh, how do we get to this point? And, again, this is a big effort by the Taliban. This is probably the most serious push we've seen uh, of the season. But we find that the Afghans are still resilient. And, again, they still control all the population centers. And they will continue to engage the Taliban uh, with the assistance uh, of the team uh, here. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned um, about 100 uh, American troops under the Arabs and are in Lashkadar. Um, is that a rotational thing, or are they additional to about how many you're all uh, it's all of that, Lynn, is still to be determined. So, of course, we had not maintained a full-time presence in Lashkar Gah. So it is, you know, it is moving some troops to help provide the force protection for this train, advise, and assist element that's helping out the police zone. Rotational, additional? Uh, it's still to be, I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand. Like, people coming out? Or no, so we did not have anybody physically like in Lashkar Gah. Now you have a new... Yes, to help with the train, advise, and assist. And it's, again, we use the term expeditionary because this will really be, their presence there will be essentially conditions-based. It won't be a permanent presence there. They will uh, return, uh, you know, to wherever their bases are. But the intent is that they assist the police zone uh, down there as needed. Mm -hmm. Sir, I agree for all your news. Uh, generally, you talked about the tactics of Taliban. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. So the, the first, let me take your second part of the question first and, and then go back to the first one. So the, the, the general piece of advice, and of course, advice in each location is going to be different. It's going to be somewhat tailored and unique to what's happening at that particular place at that particular time. But overall, we think it's incredibly important for the Afghans to stay on the offense that they've got to be able to continue to move um, offensively against the Taliban. And that's where we believe that we have seen them have uh, the most success. Our concern is when they get spread out in multiple checkpoints, they become vulnerable, and the Taliban is able to kind of pick and choose at the time that they want to to be able to engage those A and DSF forces. So our, our overall general advice is that they've got to stay on the offense and they've got to continue to identify Talib Taliban locations uh, and aggressively go after them. Uh, in terms of a change of tactics, really, uh, from last year, it's, it's probably still a little bit too early to tell. We do still see the Taliban conducting these raids. We see them essentially preying on some of these checkpoints uh, and being able, again, to go in and, and attack uh, and then loot the locations uh, and then leave. What we have not seen really is kind of the large formations where they're trying to go in and take and then hold uh, a particular area. Uh, and so that's probably um, one of the changes we've seen this year. And of course, as I mentioned, and again, I don't want to sound like I'm underplaying the Taliban, but it's important to remember that they're not invincible. And again, they do have their own challenges. They've had financial challenges. They've had leadership challenges those types of things as well. So in some ways, they do have to work to reconsolidate and, and get their efforts moving forward as well. Okay. Hi, Sam from Washington Post. 
I have one um, small question and then a broad one. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's asked about Kunduz, so I'll ask two very specific questions about Kunduz. Do you know the status of the bridge between Kunduz and Tajikistan? And um, do you know whether or not civilians or officials are beginning to leave Kunduz City? Uh, on the first one, the status of the bridge, I, I don't know. Uh, I do know that a bridge uh, just north of Kunduz was damaged, but I don't have the specific uh, details. The, the ANDSF can probably give you that uh, as well. And then in terms of civilians, I, I, I don't have that information uh, either. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't have that, Pam. So this is my broader mm -hmm. question. Two of your favorite topics are <clears throat> creating a system where Troops will be able to rotate in and out on a regular basis and mm -hmm. get rest and training while they're not fighting to so mm -hmm. make that a regular thing. Um, the second one is um, um, to be more strategic in how the Afghan defense forces act and operate. They don't run after the soccer ball like they're playing PV soccer mm -hmm. ball. They pick and choose their targets. Mm -hmm. So given those two strategic goals, how does something like this sudden, you know, flare-up, where you've got Hellman followed by a Rogman followed by Kunduz, affect that those broader goals where you have everybody running towards the soccer ball? Sure. It, it does have an impact. I would tell you that in the Kunduz scenario, this Operation Shafak, um, again, the intent was they started in Kunduz in the spring, moved to Hellman, went to Nangahar, and so they were already in the process of beginning to shift their focus up to Kunduz. So in this case, it wasn't so much the, the metaphor of the soccer ball, uh, so to speak. But nonetheless, w you know, we say in the, in the American military that the enemy has a vote and that the enemy does engage and that they can, you know, they, they do end up changing your plans. And so you can start with a plan uh, and then, of course, conditions on the ground require you to, to make adjustments to it. So again, in this case, the ANDSF was already beginning to, to move their focus and their looks up to, uh, up to Kunduz. But, you know, attacks like this, they do require a response. And so initially, that makes the ANDSF reactive until they can get the appropriate forces up there and then they can start uh, reclaiming and, and uh, offensively uh, going after the Taliban. Yeah, thanks. Um, so let me, uh, the first question you had about the use of the B-52s, and uh, we have not used uh, B-52s in Kunduz or Helmand. In fact, there's really only, uh, we used them about a month ago, uh, and it was really only in two instances uh, targeting uh, ISK. Um, I know that sometimes the, the image of a B-52 has connotations associated with it. But ultimately, from our perspective here on the ground, the delivery platform is really not that important. It's really what effects they achieve on the ground against specific targets. So in our view, it doesn't really matter if it's a remotely piloted aircraft uh, that does it. It doesn't matter if it's an F-16 or a B-52. What we're just looking for is, you know, we've got people who will determine, here's your target, Here's the appropriate type of munitions, and then they figure out whatever the delivery system is. So we really don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about B-52 versus something else. We just look at the effects uh, on the ground. And then you mentioned, you know, there has been reporting about ceasefire, potential ceasefire between ISK and Taliban. We have not seen any evidence of that. Uh, it's certainly possible uh, that in small, uh, tactical, very local areas that there's uh, a temporary truce for whatever reason. But institutionally, we still believe that the Taliban and ISK are absolutely still going after each other. Um, so we have, we have not seen evidence to suggest that there is a ceasefire or a truce or that the two organizations are, are joining together. You say that Taliban are facing leadership challenges in the meantime, financial challenges mm -hmm. as well. And on the other hand, we are witnessing that they are gaining territory in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and from those colonial these places. What is the main problem with the, with the ANSF? Mm -hmm. Is it their leadership? Is it the equipment problem? Or is it more of 
we do not have the the the, the, the NSA, we do not have more private funds. Yeah. Well, I, I think your question kind of suggests again that the Taliban is on a large offensive and, and again that they are somewhat invincible and that the ANDSF is falling back. And granted, there have certainly been some tactical success for the Taliban in Helmand, uh, although that's starting to stabilize. And then the same in Kunduz. And we're confident that the ANDSF will get that uh, under control. But as we look at the entire nation holistically, and we look at multiple locations to include the Northeast and the Paktia, Paktika Coast area and other parts, overall we do still feel like the ANDSF uh, is moving forward and that they are on this positive trajectory. But you ask about challenges, and of course the ANDSF does have challenges. Um, every military does. But, you know, we've, we've heard these discussions about um, concern about leadership. Uh, again, making sure that you've got the right leaders at the right location that can really influence what's going on. There are clearly challenges of corruption, and that is something that will ultimately, if, if not adequately addressed, ultimately undermines the entire uh, endeavor. And, of course, they still are a fairly young military that's working to learn how to incorporate some of their capabilities, be it the A-29 aircraft, the MD-530 helicopters, some of the intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities, uh, et cetera. And so they are still learning uh, every single day. And again, some days they're, they're not going to have good days, and other days they are going to have successful days. And one more small question, actually. What is the state of Daesh in Afghanistan after the operation in Khotan uh, in Mingar? Sure. We, we believe that the operations in July actually did some significant damage to, to Daesh. Uh, again, we think that hundreds of them were killed. We think that they lost some key leadership to, you know, specifically Hafez Syed Khan. Um, they lost some of their command and control capability, and they lost terrain. Uh, they were really kind of pushed out, and the ANDSF has been able to move into Kat, parts of Daybala and parts of Achin to really try and secure that population in those areas. And so we think that the Daesh presence is probably somewhere between 1,000 and, and 1,500, probably right in the middle. They are still certainly uh, a threat, um, but at the end of the day, we think that they are in a much weaker position uh, than they were before those operations began. Uh, after the General Nicholson got the additional authorities mm -hmm. for the U.S. troops, and, uh, what are the fruits of those um, additional authorities to say so? Um, I mean, uh, uh, the deal was that if the uh, Afghan forces are under a lot of pressure that they are uh, uh, about to lose the battle, uh, then the Americans were to step in. I mean, don't you, don't you think that uh, it's time to step in in, in Kunduz and mm -hmm. in Helmand? Sure. So let me uh, just kind of uh, give you, a, a, again, a quick summary of what those authorities uh, really are. So the newest authorities that President Obama gave the United States, and again, this is U.S., not the larger NATO, but specific to the U.S., was in June he approved a concept called strategic effects. And so again, what the United States can now do is... Um, uh, well, and before I hit that, let me go back to where the authorities were. The other big authority that you're describing was referred to as preventing a strategic defeat. So in other words, if it looked like the Taliban was about to take over something that was strategic to the Afghan government, the United States could go in and provide these combat enablers to prevent whatever, uh, whatever the loss was going to be. So that was fairly, a fairly defensive, fairly reactive type of authorities. So these new authorities, uh, this strategic effects authorities, allows the United States to frankly become more proactive and more deliberate about targeting uh, and about assistance. So specifically, you know, those authorities were provided and what we saw was the Nangarhar operation with the ability to use those authorities uh, for that. Because Hellman and Kunduz are still a part of this strategic game plan, the, uh, uh, this strategic campaign plan for the ANDSF, what you see is we are able to provide combat enablers uh, down in Hellman uh, and down in Kunduz to assist the Afghans as they move forward. So that one of the key things about this, though, is that the use of these authorities has to be tied to an Afghan operation. It's not something that we use unilateral or something that we would go off at some part of the country that's not associated with a strategic 
campaign plan. So we are using those authorities. We're trying to be uh, as aggressive as we possibly can. Uh, and we do use them in Kunduz, and we do use them in Hellman, and then we do use them in Nangahar. Mm -hmm. Hans Mart, yeah, it's unfortunately three minutes. Um, <laughs> on the, some questions that were before. Um, regarding senior leadership that goes into the field, uh, mm -hmm. if I understand you correctly, you displayed it as um, a good example of um, leadership uh, taking responsibility. Uh, I know that some different Zatashis in town think the problem is there is an over-centralization. Mm -hmm. Why has the deputy uh, chief of um, army staff go to Kunduz? Why isn't there a regional commander doing this? Um, it's also on smaller level, um, like a lack of massive concept. Um, in how far are you concerned that um, uh, this fact that senior leadership goes in hampers um, good leadership on lower level? And uh, a second question, you mentioned financial problems uh, of the Taliban. Mm -hmm. uh, could you be more specific on that? Sure. So again, the idea of leadership at, at the lower level and the senior leaders kind of uh, engaging on that. You know, our, our view continues to be one of the, the number one thing that the ANDSF has got to focus on overall is going to be leadership. And it happens at all levels uh, in both the Army as well as with the police forces. And at times, what we find is occasionally, it, and it's the same in any Western military as well, senior leaders do have to come down and they've got to put their physical presence uh, on the ground to um, help provide specific guidance, to help engage the troops so that they know that the senior leadership is aware of what they're doing, to help marshal resources, those types of things. So that is what I think we're seeing. But that said, leadership has been at times a challenge for the security forces. And so we've seen, you know, just over the last year, and you, you guys have heard me say this before, you know, the ANDSF over the winter, they relieved and exchanged over 100 different leaders, and that was just by about the March-April time frame. So they're constantly looking for leaders who are going to be able to perform at what we would kind of call the next level. And so there are sometimes a leader who at a company level is very good, but he gets moved up to a battalion level, and he's not as good. And so there's a constant effort to try and identify the appropriate leaders at the right locations for it. But ultimately, you know, a senior leader coming to engage uh, can become decisive. And ultimately, that's what you expect of your leaders, is to be leading by example and to go out uh, and be able to engage with their troops. Um, and then uh, you, uh, the financial question. So what we've seen is that uh, Mullah Mansour, as you're probably well aware, was essentially the finance guy for the Taliban. And um, you know, clearly deeply involved with the poppy and the, the, the drug trade. And what we believe is that there, is, so there are some financial challenges for the Taliban right now because the, after his death, uh, there has been some uncertainty as to where some of the money is. We've seen an increase in some of the taxation that the Taliban does to either their farmers or others out in the field. We see them essentially harvesting more money from the local population, uh, again, based on taxes. And that is something we think is associated with the fact that Mansoor did have a lot of that money, and we think a lot of that money uh, is nowhere to be found right now. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions at this time? Yeah. There was some reports that some uh, soldiers uh, in the front line uh, they complained that uh, we should not get enough uh, food and mm -hmm. uh, weapons. You, are you uh, aware of this report? We are aware of that, and I think in some cases it is probably true. And again, it goes back to this larger discussion we're having about leadership. What you expect of a leader at what I would call the company level, so the unit of 30 people or 130 people, that type of level, is those leaders have absolutely got to be committed to taking care of their soldiers. And they've got to make sure they've got food and ammunition and clothing and that they have support when they require that support. And as we know, that does not always happen sometimes, and that certainly affects the morale of the young soldiers. And I think it's a contributing factor to some of the things that we've seen, whether it's in Hellman uh, or in Kunduz. And so that's why there is this constant, constant look at leadership at all levels uh, identifying those who are successful and then identifying those who are not doing the right things and trying to remove that from them to take care of these these younger soldiers. Yes, sir. I think the last question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like you to ask about the uh, resources 
use of uh, Taliban exactly. Mm -hmm. We all know that uh, Taliban are giving their resources from Pakistan and Saudi are facing some of uh, Pakistani commanders that have came la from Lashkar Jangari and Lashkar Taylashi mm -hmm. Also they are fighting in Kunduz and also some of them are fighting in Bama and uh, the officials that they are in these provinces they are saying that the self these fighters are fighting against ADC. So what are your assessments to just tackle these guys who are coming from Pakistan and they are fighting against our forces? So it's a, a direct war of Pakistan and Afghanistan, not the Taliban. And the Taliban are giving more support from the Pakistanis. They are planning for them. They are just uh, giving them the roadmap of the fight like this. So what would be your assessments for these all? Well, our view is that right now, today, there are about 10 terrorist organizations uh, in this region that have been designated by the U.S. State Department as foreign terrorist organizations. And we think, of course, that there are three violent extremist organizations, which certainly includes the Taliban with the biggest threat. Our concern has been and continues to be what General Nicholson refers to as convergence of these groups. Um, as we all know, uh, you know, sometimes when you look at these particular groups, you think that, well, they're divided and that they don't spend any time and that they're autonomous operations. But I think what we know is that many of these individuals were in, grew up in the same locations. They trained together at some point. And so what we see is sometimes these organizations do work together uh, to fight the legitimate government. Other times they conduct independent <coughs> operations. And then, of course, sometimes we see them fight with each other uh, as well. And so we do have concerns uh, about these organizations with this again, this idea of convergence, where they're able to pool their resources and their expertise and conduct specific attacks. So it is something that we watch closely. Uh, of course, from a U.S. unilateral standpoint, uh, we do have the authority to directly uh, target by status both al-Qaeda uh, and ISK, and we do continue to do that. Um, and then as for the others, our work is with the Afghan government. And, it, and again, this goes back to the ultimate reason the NATO is here right now, is to help develop the security forces so they can defend their own borders and their own people um, from these types of threats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lynn, so this answer is not going to satisfy you, but we don't have a definition really for that. Um, obviously, we uh, receive information from multiple sources. Some of it is the public reporting, uh, as you described. Some of it is our own intelligence collection. Some of it comes from the Afghans as well. And so what we're constantly looking at is trying to, to maintain an updated assessment of where things are. Again, the, uh, our view is that Lashkargah in particular is not about to fall. Um, granted, there the Taliban have the ability to commit violent acts, be it sometimes in the city or in the suburbs, and certainly we've seen that in some of the districts. But we don't believe that Lashkargah is about to fall, and we don't believe the same for Kunduz City. Uh, and again, um, you know, our role is to, again, just not listen to one source of information, but to try and take as many sources of information as we possibly can. But your specific question, we don't have a specific definition uh, to, to answer your question. Mm -hmm. 